I'll tell you, all of the data says I'm not supposed to be here. I'm motivated by the kinetic energy and the potential of our neighborhoods, our neighbors, and our communities. So I have from Back Bay to Roxbury, and it's two miles in between geographically, a world apart. There's a 33 year difference in life expectancy. 100% of the future is in the hands of our young people. Right now, it's only a 13% requirement to build affordable housing. Um, I would raise it to 20%, which is what Cambridge uh, has done. So I worked with Google to expand their presence here. I'm gonna continue to kick the butt of the person uh, down in DC who has um, had anti-immigrant policies. Well, welcome to the Dorchester Post. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I like your, your tie, actually. I did, I, I, did, I did go ahead and do my uh, Obama tie today. I just, for some reason, I just felt like I needed to do that today. Mm -hmm. well, that's good. That's a, a good message. So, um, it, you know, the reason of this interview is to, uh, or, the, or the, what we want to, to earn from you from this interview is, is from a perspective of a neighbor. We want to yeah. know you from, you know, from the perspective of a Dorchester neighbor. Yeah. So we want to know you in a personal way first, and then we're going to get into politics and also into the issues that, you know, we have uh, um, find here in Dorchester. Okay. So, okay, so first of all, uh, I want to know about your childhood. Yeah. Yeah, so when, where, you know, did you born, where did you grow up? Yeah, so um, I'm really blessed, man. I, I was born at Boston City Hospital, which is now Boston Medical Center. I was born in 1975, um, and I like to, it, it was the s seven days before I was born, it was all cloudy weather, it was the longest um, uh, amount of uh, cloudy weather in that year. So I like to tell my mom that the clouds parted and the sun shined down, and then that's why I was there. And that, and, and that didn't happen, actually. I, uh, um, I was born in a difficult situation. Um, I was born to a 13-year-old mom um, who was sexually assaulted by two guys. And so a lot of my work and uh, some of the things that I'm really passionate about um, are ensuring um, that men redefine manhood, that we challenge each other, um, that we fight rape culture, um, and that we uh, really uh, think about um, our place and our role uh, in terms of uh, changing uh, sexual assault and uh, domestic violence. That's, I'm very passionate about that. Um, but back to my family story. So I was born there. I was in foster care for one month. And, uh, and, and then my second month, an amazing Boston thing happened to me. I was adopted. And so I got adopted by my mom, Rosa Jackson. Uh, she had a daycare for 25 years. Um, and my dad, Herb Jackson, who was an entrepreneur, he started the first uh, recycling, one of the first recycling companies in Boston, um, and also uh, really fought hard for women, people of color, and Boston residents to get on construction job sites. And so uh, they adopted me, and they also adopted four of us. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, three of us. So it's four in total. Okay. And they, there were four, we have four older brothers and sisters who we refer to them as the children that they had. Um, I remind that my, my older brothers and sisters that I was chosen, unlike them, they just had them. Um, and so, but we, we grew up in, in a, and we all lived in a house, eight of us uh, as kids and our parents lived in a house. And then we also um, lived in a neighborhood with no, nosy neighbors. Uh, next door, my next door neighbor had an ice cream truck, and that's how he took care of himself. And his mom was, when I would uh, open the door and I wasn't supposed to open the door, she would tell my mom. And uh, again, eight people, uh, eight kids living in a house with a driveway and a backyard. You know what? That was normal. That was a normal place and normal time in Dorchester. The, one of the things that really gets to me now is that people can't live here anymore. 
Folks are getting forced out of the city every single day. So you grew up in Dorchester? Dorchester, Roxbury line. So I, I, we, we, there's, there's debates on, on my neighborhood. I consider it Roxbury. I, uh, some people are, the, the male considers it Dorchester, and all of the bills get to us regardless of what they write there, right? Okay. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I grew up right in Grove Hall, right at the intersection of uh, Blue Hill Ave and um, Schuyler Street is, is my street. And I'll tell you, it, it, was, it was a tough time when I was a kid. 1991, um, there were 152 murders in the city of Boston. And many of them were in the neighborhood that I grew up in. So I saw a lot of, a lot of violence in, in the community. Um, and I'm just blessed that my parents continued to make sure that we were engaged in uh, extracurricular activities, that we had a good educational opportunity. And that's why I, I, I do this work. Um, okay. After school, I went to college. I went to the University of New Hampshire. I, I'm going to ask you some back. details yeah. about that. Yeah. But I, I want to know also, like, if you know what's your, or how you define your, your ethnicity. Yeah. So do, do you know? So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm African American, um, which is uh, a, um, uh, my mom is from uh, North Carolina, and my dad is from a place called Plimpton, Mass., which is right next to Plymouth. Um, and he went to Silver Lake Regional down there, and he's a, you know, uh, was a great football player. So, uh, you know, and um, I'm African American, and um, I, uh, I, my, my walk, and, I, and I, I actually use black, um, and the reason why I use that terminology is because um, many of the things and the manner in which I, I, um, am, I walk through the world um, is based on um, the manner in which people view me. And so I think it's really an important, and it's not everyone's from, who has the skin tone I have is from America. And so there's folks from the Caribbean, there's folks from Africa, um, and there's folks from all around the world. So um, I actually uh, use the term black. All right. So let's go to uh, your family. Mm -hmm. So you have a wife or kids? Uh, neither. Neither? Um, I, other than I, I do have 58,000 kids um, <laughs> in the Boston Public Schools. I'm chair of education. Okay. So I consider every single one of those young people mine as my, my little brothers and little sisters. So you, you're totally focused on politics? Yes, I am. OK. Uh, so you told me a little bit of your education. So like, where, where did you go to college? Yeah. So I went to the University of New Hampshire. I'm a Wildcat. Um, and uh, it was an amazing experience. It was, it was, it was a tough experience initially, because um, when I got to the school, um, one of the things that I hadn't paid attention to um, are, was the ethnic makeup of the school. And so when I first got there the first day, I walked into this really large room. I had 3,000 people in it, and I didn't see another black person. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. We might have, we might have an a, a orientation someplace else. I apologize for interrupting y'all, but we, I ended up finding out we had 54 black students out of 12,000. Okay. Um, at the time that I went to University of New Hampshire. And a funny story I like to tell is that my first class, there were 200 people in the class, and the teacher was like, uh, yeah, we don't take attendance. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to come to class. I know, I know that. But I was stretched a lot um, because, uh, because of that. And so I was able to step forward um, and pushed into roles of leadership that I may or may not have, have done or gotten into in, in other schools. So I ended up uh, becoming president of the Black Student Union, and I then went on to become president of the whole student body at the University of New Hampshire. So I'm very proud of my time there and just really uh, motivated uh, because we were able to make a difference. Um, uh, we, we were able to put forward demands um, to actually have, uh, to demand uh, more recruitment for students of color, uh, better conditions, um, and more supports for students of color at our school, and that happened. And it wasn't based on adults at the time, it was actually young people just making, making things happen. I believe the same mentality here, it's not based on how much money you have in your bank account um, or your title. You can do something in your neighborhood for your community, for your family, that's significant. And that's why I, I love the city of Boston, that's why I love Dorchester, why I love Roxbury and the whole city. All right, so public life, what make you want to be a political leader? Yeah, I just, I wanna give back. I wanna, I wanna pay it forward for, I'll tell you, all of the data says I'm not supposed to be here. How is that? 
in the 90s, what was drilled into our heads as black, young black men was we weren't going to make it till we were 25. All of these things were, were happening. Um, uh, I grew, I'm from the neighborhood I grew up in and uh, that I grew up poor. I'm not supposed to be here. Well, you know what? I don't listen to the data. I don't listen to the, to, to the statistics. Um, what my job is to do is to provide um, opportunities uh, for folks. And when I look at, in particular, schools, um, education was such an amazing part of all of the opportunities that I've been uh, given. Uh, the Boston Public Schools get, have gotten cut um, every year for the past three and a half years, which is unacceptable. When I look at the 30% increase in violence, uh, and actually, I'm sorry, in shootings in the city of Boston currently, and the fact that we only, we only uh, solve or have an arrest in 4%, 4% of non-fatal shootings in our city, I knew I had to step forward. Uh, and so I, uh, my initial part of public life was in uh, working for uh, a guy who wanted to be uh, governor, had never run for anything in his whole life. His name was Deval Patrick. Oh, wow. and I. Handed out literature, I made phone calls and all this stuff. They got elected. Yeah. Um, and then I had an opportunity to, to work in the administration. And I did economic development, which meant bringing companies to the state of Massachusetts who were going to hire people. So I worked with Google to expand their presence here. I worked with Microsoft um, to expand uh, their presence here. They went from uh, only being a Waltham to two 125,000 square foot buildings. Um, Google went from 40 to 800. Um, it, it's amazing, and then you got to see people get jobs yeah. and change their lives and, and have opportunities. Um, and so that's what I'm, I'm motivated by, the kinetic energy and the potential of our neighborhoods, our neighbors, and our communities. And not only these big companies, right? And we'll get into that, but we're straight, stroking these huge checks to $150 million from the state to General Electric, $25 million uh, from the city to General Electric, right? And there are small businesses in this neighborhood who could use an upgrade of the front of their building. Yeah. There are places in this facility right here who could use some working capital because they just got a contract. And they deserve to, to grow. And I'll tell you something. Interestingly, 85% of all businesses in the state of Massachusetts are 50 people or less. And by the way, it's small, innovative, young businesses that the Kauffman Foundation says uh, actually creates jobs and has all, created almost all of the jobs over the past 30 years. In the economic downturn, the people who cut and downsized and laid people off, those are companies like General Electric. Yeah. They lost five million jobs during that uh, during the economic downturn. Small, innovative companies added 1.5 million jobs while those companies were were shedding jobs. I want to invest in our neighborhoods and communities, and I want to uh, have community economic development, not only economic development, because the businesses that are, are in our neighborhoods and communities, they're going to hire people from these neighborhoods and communities, and when they grow, the whole neighborhood the whole community and families as a whole uh, have a tendency to rise. All right. Uh, well, now we're going to start getting more into politics. So yeah. this is very important. I want actually to know this because this is going to make me understand better. Mm -hmm. So why are you running for mayor yeah. regardless? You know, uh, Marty Warsh, yeah. that is uh, your same party, mm -hmm. is you know in, in office and he is running too. Yeah. Um, I'm running for mayor because um, I believe I have the best vision for the city of Boston. Boston is a city that has uh, uh, some of the highest income inequality in the whole United States of America. And uh, a year ago, we actually were number one, um, and we've got, jumped, jumped down a little bit um, from that. Um, a white family in Boston has a median net worth of $247,500. A black family in Boston has a median net worth of $8. A Dominican family in Boston has a median net worth of $0. That's our, and, and th those are not my numbers. That is called the color of wealth, and it's from the Boston Federal Reserve Bank. And that translates into life or death. So I have from Back Bay to Roxbury, and it's two miles in between geographically, a world apart. There's a 33-year difference in life expectancy. In Back Bay, 
people live to 91.9, and in Roxbury, people live to 58.9, which is lower than the life expectancy of Iraq. Wow. That's in our city and in our time. And I'm running today because um, the, the city of Boston is gentrifying out the current residents that live in the city of Boston. We are displacing people from all races, all backgrounds, and sadly, all socioeconomic uh, strata. People in every single neighborhood are just simply fighting to try to stay here. And so that, that's one of the reasons why I run. I'm running also because the mayor is approving housing that is absolutely, completely unaffordable for people in the city of Boston. And the rising cost of rents are pushing uh, folks out of the city on a regular basis. I'm also running because I've, I've had to have conversations this close with too many folks who've lost their children. There are people who are dying in parts of the city. Um, and this summer, uh, and actually uh, two weeks ago, there were two people shot and killed on a Sunday. Um, absolutely, wholly unacceptable in our city. And we, we are not solving these crimes. Um, and by the way, and I would submit to you, you know what, if it happened in some different neighborhoods, then we would have uh, a huge reaction if this were, and I, want, I believe that a life on uh, Blue Hill Ave or Dorchester Ave should mean the same as a life on uh, Commonwealth Avenue or Marlboro Street. Um, and, I, and I guess lastly I run because the young people need, need us. Um, we, 100% of the future is in the hands of our young people. And when we turn our backs on our young people, first of all, when we lose one, in particular to violence, we lose a part of our future, every single young person. But also, we lose a part of their, of their future and their potential when we don't educate them. And so as mayor, I'm going to uh, not only do reading, writing, arithmetic, and all the stuff they're doing right now, we're going to introduce uh, uh, several things. One, we're going to put uh, music and art back in schools, because they've been removed from many of our schools. I'm also going to have a K-12 through curriculum for uh, computer science. So all of our young people, from kindergarten through 12th grade, will have that opportunity. And finally, we're going to give them the wraparound services that they need. There's a lot of young people who have trauma. And by the way, we have, we have 4,000 homeless students in the Boston Public Schools, 4,000. When I started as chair of education, there were 1,500. Now there's 4,000. And by the way, at the same time, uh, you know, the, the mayor shut down Long Island Bridge and made homelessness worse in the city of Boston, made the addiction issues that people are, are facing worse because it destabilized um, the community uh, that uh, depended on them. I am there uh, as mayor. I will be bringing the people of the city of Boston with me uh, on a regular basis to, to City Hall. I look forward to being the people's mayor of the city of Boston. Okay, uh, now going into Dorchester. So mm -hmm. yeah. how well do you think you know Dorchester? I know Dorchester pretty well. Are you, are you gonna give me a quiz? No, well, <laughs> you probably no. know better. I, I know, I, I've, lived, I've lived in Boston all, all of my life and I've, uh, I've explored uh, many, many parts of uh, Dorchester um, and uh, some of them have been, many of them have been with adult beverages, um, but I, I know the area pretty well. And it's to me one of the richest uh, uh, ethnic parts of the city. Uh, in terms of ethnic diversity, in terms of um, the uh, diversity of socioeconomic class, um, and also uh, culture uh, in, in, the, in the city. And there's a richness um, to, uh, to Dorchester, and it's also, also its history, because I'm a history major, so I, um, that's one of the uh, pieces that I actually am very attracted to. Okay, so big question. How do you vision, imagine Dorchester in the future? Yeah. So say 2030, as you know, they yeah. they did this, you know, project about yeah. 2030. Uh, and and I would I would go a little further. So I, my vision for the city of Boston is to make decisions today that are that are going to be solid decisions for 20 years from now. And so um, the decisions that are being made right now are knee-jerk reactions. And so a couple things: um, Dorchester um, is being overbuilt right now. And uh, there, is, there is not a, uh, a cohesive, thoughtful, connected plan for the building that's happening. They're allowing, uh, and, and Mayor Walsh and the, and the uh, BRA, 
um, what, I'm sorry, the BPDA. So understand, this is the, our planning organization that's okay. supposed to actually plan and develop. They only develop. They're not planning, okay. right? And, and the reason, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, sit on, go on Dorchester Ave right now, right? At, at many parts of the day, it takes a half an hour to go a block, yeah. right? And the reason why that's occurring is because people are building housing without thinking about infrastructure, right? And so what we have to have is a uh, neighborhood focused, and actually let's not even pull, pull back, a people focused planning department okay. that thinks about people instead of buildings. Because by the way, if you think about people, all of the other things that people need will flow from, from there. And so we don't currently do that. Um, so what I look forward to is a, a diverse, multi-racial, um, multi-ethnic, and multi-economic strata Dorchester to remain. That's, that's been the, the amazing part about Dorchester for my whole life. And what we're doing now is we're losing this. The average transaction in the city of Boston right now for a home is six ninety nine, right? The things that they're building in, in Dorchester included um, should instead of uh, so eighty seven percent of the housing that's being built is being built for the top twenty five percent. Fifty percent of people in Boston make thirty five thousand or less. That includes people in Dorchester. So when you build housing, that's for uh, that's eight hundred thousand dollar condos or. $700,000 condos, you are not building for the people who are currently here. So what I look forward to is a Dorchester, so to ha not have dot block run people out of their neighborhood and run people over. Mm -hmm. To not allow uh, the Kraft family, if they, if they want, just want, simply want to, to build a field over um, on the UMass campus just because they want to. And I envision a future of Dorchester where the people of Dorchester get to determine its future, and where there is a neighborhood council that really is thoughtfully planning and working towards um, the uh, future of the city, uh, the, the uh, 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 city as a whole, but uh, of Dorchester. That is what we need, and we also need to listen to the voices of the people who built this neighborhood up, who made it safe, because yeah. it wasn't always safe, who made it clean, and who've loved it up. We have, and there's equity in that. Whether you own it or not, there's equity in what people have been able to do in this community. Okay, so some issues about Dorchester. Uh, public education, how will you make it better, the public education mm -hmm. in Dorchester? Well, so one of the things um, that I will do day one um, is we're going to do an equity audit of all of our schools. Um, and we're going to look at first the physical state of the buildings. Um, Boston, two-thirds of the buildings were uh, two-thirds of schools were built before 1945. Um, there, there was, uh, an, uh, in, the, in the Walsh administration the, the, a year ago, um, there were schools where lead water was running through the pipes and kids were drinking it. Yeah. Um, that happened at the, uh, at the Mather. And there were mistakes made um, where our children were, so you know, people look at, point at Flint, Flint, that was happening. Uh, uh, some of that was happening here. So one, we needed to do an equity audit of all of the school buildings. The other piece is um, we also need to look at the number of seats that Dorchester needs um, to, to educate its young people. What we have is a, we have a mayor who uh, for two years said that there were too many seats in the Boston Public Schools. There's that there were 90,000 seats. You know what? Bogus. Totally misleading, because you know the last time there were 90,000 seats was in 1974 when we desegregated the schools. What we know now is there's not enough seats for the number of students who are in the Boston public schools. Okay. There's a 4,000 child waiting list for early education. Interesting about early education, that is the best predictor, other than your parents' grade level attainment or how much your family makes, of how uh, or whether or not you will graduate high school. So we should be doing all of those young people should be in school because the best way to get them to graduate is that if they're in school. So that would be a, a, a piece. And I guess on, on, on the public education front, um, I would also um, ensure that we have some new offerings for high schools um, city, citywide. Um, I would really look forward to, I want to do uh, Entrepreneurship Academy. 
uh, okay. for uh, a high school as a thematic high school where people uh, learn through the, uh, the mentality of being an entrepreneur. Um, and I would also like to do a recording academy um, where uh, people learn the recording business Okay. Um, and the music business, partnering with uh, Berkeley College of Music. Um, so young people get excited about this. Yeah. And that's the other, the other component. They get excited about it, right? And so we should be doing the things that young people get excited about. Um, and so that's uh, really uh, some of the things that I look forward to. Great, so we are running out of time, but I'm I have some questions. Yeah. No, no problem, that's, that's totally normal. So I have, you know, some issues uh, there are, one is public transportation, the other is racism, gentrification, yeah. and immigration. Yeah. So let's try to do it you know, as, yeah. as quick as we can. Yeah. So public transportation, how will you make better the public transportation in Dorchester? Oh, so um, from a public transportation perspective, we need uh, better bike infrastructure um, in this area, and we need to be thoughtful about planning it. But also, I think the other component that we need, uh, Dorchester, parts of Dorchester have poor service um, to the MBTA. Um, and some of the most disparate service. Uh, and, and, and we should we spend about $40 million a year subsidizing the T. And so I would use our subsidy as leverage in having a conversation with the state in terms of how we can better uh, coordinate um, the uh, coordinate and also add to uh, transportation infrastructure uh, in, in this area. And I th also think we should be looking at bus rapid transit. Um, I've got to go to Mexico City and saw, uh, saw how they were uh, able to move over 9 million people a day uh, on, in, in their system. And they're a little bit older than Boston. And so I think if they can figure out a way, then we, we should do that. Okay. okay. Just to let you know, we have a problem with the bus shelters. There is almost no bus shelters in the whole Dorchester. And we almost doesn't have uh, meters, parking meters. So, you know, with that, you can get some money. Yeah, and also you, you have issues with, without meters. You also have issues with your small businesses because that means that customers cannot get to the to the businesses. Yeah. So that becomes a critical piece. And they, the but you deserve bus shelters because you're some of the best. Uh, you're the best customers. Okay, okay. Racism. Do you think there are the same opportunities for any person of any race to become a political, economical, cultural, or social leader in Boston? Uh, racism is real. Racism still exists. It's alive and well. Um, two weeks ago, we saw people who were blatantly racist, uh, uh, Holocaust deniers, uh, folks from the Klan, um, folks who are white supremacists come to the city of Boston. But we also saw a anaphylactoid reaction in the city of Boston where over 45,000 people said, mm -mm, we're not doing that um, and we're going to stand up. But, but to yeah. your point, though, yeah. in the city of Boston, no, there's disparities in, in the city of Boston. There's little disparities. Um, when, when you look at the economic disparities, that translates into people not having the same level of access to a whole host of, uh, of, of, uh, of issues. Um, and I'll tell you something that just happened in, to me this past uh, week, um, this past weekend. I was walking in the Caribbean Carnival Parade. I brought some young men, um, uh, most of them of color, um, who, are, who are bike riders. They like do tricks and stuff on their bikes. And I said, hey, um, I called them last week. I said, hey, uh, be part of my contingent. I would love for you to, to ride your bikes. They did this for the, for the, uh, uh, the gay pride parade. Uh, they came and they rode their bikes. And the police surrounded them and said that they had to, had to leave. And I had to step forward um, and uh, get them back into uh, the parade. Um, those are young men who are in a parade route, in a parade that I paid for um, to be in, um, and who were stopped by the police. And uh, had, there's still no justification as to why they were stopped. We have a lot of work to do. Now, mind you, I, lo I, I love and respect the Boston Police Department. And so that's one of the other areas that we need to look at is how we diversify our police department and every uh, level um, and, and uh, race as well as gender. We have a lot of work to do, but we can do it together. And it can't only be people of color. Yeah. Right? It has to be the majority and our, 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 our white friends also who are part of having that conversation. Okay. Uh, gentrification, you already said something about that, but I want to know, like, how can you stop that? Yeah. So one of, some of the ways that we can affect it is um, having a plan, uh, separating planning and development. The BRA is um, a, a rubber stamp 
The BRA absolutely does not represent the people of the city of Boston um, and is really um, the, uh, the easy pass for, uh, for um, uh, those who are developers. That's all they're doing. And so when it comes down to it, we need a separate planning department from a development part department. And then, by the way, the public land that we have should be used for public good. So we should build to scale with the public land that we have that's affordable home ownership too, right? Not only rentals, I want to, how we stabilize neighborhoods, communities, and families is actually home ownership. Um, so that's one of the things. Making, um, we, we, right now it's only a 13% requirement to build affordable housing. Um, I would raise it to 20%, which is what Cambridge uh, has done. Um, and then also I would deal with some of the issues um, in, in these neighborhoods uh, based on planning that doesn't allow you to come in and do whatever you want. What you do is if you plan, right, everyone gets on the same page, then you come in and you z change the zoning and you want to take a building that is now, everyone said you can build five stories and you want to build 15 stories? No. Right? And that makes, and then we need to look at all of that across the city of Boston um, and understand how we connect with one another as neighborhoods, communities, and as the city as a whole. Okay, last question. Yes, sir. About immigration. Yes. So, I don't know if you know, but according to data from the city, Dorchester is almost 40% immigrant. So, and there's a lot of places, you know, in Boston that are like majority immigrants, yeah. inclusive. So, how will you make Dorchester a better place for the immigrant neighbors? Definitely. So, um, a couple pieces. Just one, um, I'm going to continue to kick the butt of the person uh, down in D.C. who has um, had anti-immigrant policies. Um, and so, as a city of Boston, um, I put forward legislation, um, uh, Mayor Walsh has yet to back it, um, to create sanctuary schools. I don't want to have any young person ever exposed to federal agents while in their school, um, whether they're documented or undocumented. In addition, I put forward legislation uh, to create a uh, immig immigrant legal defense fund in the city of Boston. Because if you, and, you know, you can talk about city hall being a sanctuary, but the real deal, the real deal w that we need to deal with is if you go to Boston Immigration Court without a lawyer, you only win 4% of the time. If you go with a lawyer, just regardless of your case, you win 49% of your time, uh, of the time. So I would put forward city dollars uh, to back folks in, in this space. And then the other component is we have to be deliberate about including uh, immigrants in government, um, in advisory uh, 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 committees. And what we've seen uh, in the Latino community, we've actually seen uh, less appointees to city boards under Mayor Walsh than under Mayor Menino. Um, and so we're not inviting people in uh, to the process. Uh, immigrants, to me, embody literally what it means to be uh, an American. Because people, it takes a lot to move your whole family, to have the resolve to do that, um, to, main, uh, to be in a situation where you don't speak the language, and you come and work your butt off uh, to make it a better life for you and your family. We need more of that. Um, and in addition, we will also continue to fight for H-1B visas, um, which are uh, the work visas that are now being restricted, um, and also uh, the, uh, the ability to travel. But Boston has to be, um, and, and it's, it's a social component to it, but the other piece is we do medicine and education and technology here, right? Those are fields where so if, if something happens to me, all I need to know is that you are an MD. Right? If something, if you got to go inside me, right? You're a great doctor and do what you got to do, right? And so w those are fields that we lead in worldwide that require us um, to connect with people from all around the world. And so um, as a mayor of the city of Boston, I will continue to be upfront uh, st and, and really stand up and ensure that uh, we uh, advocate and ensure that people uh, are safe here. Lastly, I want them to be safe with the police. And so I want every uh, community, in particular those who are undocumented, uh, to feel safe and feel like that they could come and talk to the police. And that's why I backed the Trust Act, uh, which we passed uh, in, in uh, the city council in 2014.